Hi, everyone. Uh, you should have a little note about uh, us recording this session. I'm going to start sharing our PowerPoint, and Luis and I will present together. We also have Nick. <laughs> we say hi, Nick. <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you all. Um, so I guess we do a round of uh, intros for our COIL crew. I'll start by saying welcome to our COIL info session, opening doors and minds through collaborative online international learning or COIL. We're aiming for this session to be closer to a half hour because we really want to leave time to talk to you and hear about your questions and what you're interested in. My name is Sheb, like the thing in your backyard. I go by she or they pronouns. I am a teaching and learning specialist at the CTRL and I'll pass it to Louise. Good afternoon, everyone. So thankful that you could join us today. My name is Luis Alvarado. I'm actually the director, so I'm going to like uh, promote myself ad lib here yes. from the PowerPoint slide. I, I just didn't notice. This. this is my bad shed. Sorry, everyone. But director of learning design, part of the Office of Digital Learning and Strategy. Um, really excited to, to talk about some of our successes thus far with collaborative online international learning and just excited to kind of talk some examples, some specifics, and hopefully inspire some of you to be like, let's take some action, right? Let's let's set up a meeting with with Shed, Luis, Nick. Let's get this thing rolling. So with that, I'm also gonna, you know, I know we didn't say it, say it, Nick, but I'm gonna give you uh, give you the mic here and let you introduce yourself. Thanks, Shed and Luis. I'm Nick DeMeo. I also work for the Office of Digital Learning and Strategy as a senior instructional designer. And really happy to see uh, so many joined today. And just like Luis had said, uh, looking forward to uh, hearing your questions and working with you. All right. So a quick overview of today's session. Um, we are going to address our guiding questions. What is COIL? How does it benefit student learning? What are the components of a COIL course? And we'll look at some examples actually from our some of our first AU COIL courses, which is very exciting. Is COIL a good fit for my course? And then we've left a lot of time for discussion and questions. So we're actually going to start with an icebreaker. Um, and I'm going to ask you to share in the chat, or please feel free to share over audio. We're going to look at these different hand gestures and talk about what they mean to us. So again, please feel free to share. And let's start with our first one. In your culture or experience, what does this gesture mean? So let's share in the chat or over video. What does this mean to you? Oh, I love that, Kelly. Got it. Gail says, I'm good. Good job. A good. Okay. Yeah. Approval. <laughs> I need a ride. Very good point, Nick. Hitchhiking. Absolutely. Um, these are all great examples. So this is one of the ones, what do you think, Luis? This is one of the more well-known ones, do you think? I, I think so. I think uh, just for this, the sake that a lot of folks live in metropolitan areas, and I feel like also our phones have helped kind of establish, right? That this means, okay, teams, we're all on teams, teams, every time you say, okay, so. so. That's very true, the emoji of the thumbs up. Mm. Yeah, and uh, also it means I voted. Absolutely, yes, very yeah. good point. Um, as that imagery is like associated with voting in the US. Totally. Let's do our next one. In your culture or experience, what does this gesture mean? You know, someone thumbs up Jolie's <laughs> contribution. That's great. Ooh, warning. Warning. Ooh. Back off. Yeah. Over there, over pointing, there. orienting someone. <laughs> it's over there. And then as soon as they look, you run. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious, do folks have a indication? Nice nail color. Nice nail color. <laughs> yeah, I like that color. Do folks have an indication of whether this is a polite gesture, a rude gesture? How do we feel about it? Somewhat rude. Gail? Gail. Yeah, sir, go ahead, Luis. No, just uh, res responding there to Gail, somewhat rude. Could be rude. I agree. I think the rude is... Great point it's from Matthew my culture. Kelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, without a facial expression, it's hard to tell, or maybe it seems neutral without context. 
I do the same, Nick. So my parents, and I didn't realize for a long time um, that this may have been a cultural thing. My parents taught me that pointing is extremely rude. So similar to Nick, I point with my whole hand. But did did other folks learn that from from their families or from their communities? I gotta give a shout out there, Shed, to Disney. Uh, oh, I used to work yeah. uh, at Disney during my my college years in between summers, and uh, they always wanted you to point with either multiple fingers or your whole hand, never just one finger, because of the that sort of cultural cultural norm for a lot of uh, places that it's rude to point with one finger. So you always so it's got to do the whole hand. And to your point, Louis, something I recently learned is that they don't want it to be mistaken for a sign language letter, an ASL letter, since the mm. pointing, right, depending on how you do it, can be understood as a, as a sign in ASL. This is really interesting, right? It really depends on your context. All right, our last one. In your culture or experience, what does this gesture mean? I bet you would enjoy seeing me try to search for what this gesture was. <laughs> money, high cost, money. right? With the rubbing means definitely money for people. <laughs> a lot of up. maybe like a this, yeah. Expensive. <laughs> you will see what will happen to you. <laughs> um, Aldun, if I said that right, Aldun, um, I think you and I might come from similar cultures, which is hold on a second. Um, the chef's kiss capiche. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah. those. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm pretty sure I saw this on the Sopranos shed at some point. <laughs> in time. I'm pretty sure I saw this gesture on that show. <laughs> um, I've seen this called the fingers pursed. So for me, um, in Egyptian culture and a lot of Arab culture, it means like slow down, wait, but also then you get frustrated and you're like, what, you know, why aren't you listening? Right. You do both hands. Um, so yeah, to the, you will see what will happen to you. Um, what'd you say, Nick? You said chef's kiss. That's right. Chef's kiss. <laughs> it has to also explode at the end. To oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> not picture. I love it. So, um, so something we're trying to point to here is how your different cultural context, your upbringing, the place where you are right now can really make a difference with the simplest things. So um, we might see a, a hand gesture and think, oh, we all have a universal understanding of it, but it's actually very contextual. And those are the kinds of little things that will come up in a coil exchange is that we students and ourselves will adjust to different sort of cultural expectations and we'll learn those expectations from each other. So it's actually a really constructive part of the COIL process is um, helping your students adjust to a different way of communicating or studying. Uh, anything you would add, Luis and Nick? No, that's perfect, Shed. Yeah, there, there's a lot of initial negotiation that has to go on in understanding to kind of set the tone for the coil exchange. You did a great job. Thanks. All right. So I think I might uh, pass it to you now, Louise, to talk about what is coil and how does it benefit student learning? Sounds great. Thank you so much. So, so some of you might have gotten some of this content if you were able to attend our Ann Farron conference, where we really talked a little bit about specifics, but more went into some examples and showcasing about collaborative online international learning here at American University. But we have a plethora of people, some people who have heard about it, some people who have not heard about it. So it's always good to frame it, you know, start it from scratch here and talk a little bit about what is this sort of collaboration. It started in the state university system in New York, uh, basically as a way to leverage these technologies, which they've gotten better. I think this started in like 1998. So the technology has advanced quite a bit. Uh, from that time, it, basically to use technology to try to connect American students with international students via these technologies, right? So you can just imagine there's a lot of benefits there. Uh, first of all, we just had a little taste of it in the fact that it could open our eyes to intercultural sort of exchange and ideas and sort of understanding of the world, right? Our place in it potentially uh, gives the students that sort of global context, which to be honest with you, I, I think regardless of the major, just the DC location, uh, I'm imagining that no matter what subject matter you teach, there's still a touch of this sort of global context 
that touches it simply because of where we're located in DC, right? And it really is um, such a uh, such a connection spot for so many countries, so many cultures. And then, of course, my piece, you know, I work with digital learning, I work with tools. It's a great way to experiment with digital learning in your classroom. I, I think we saw it with the pandemic where everything was online, but I hope some of what you learned has stuck with you because online learning doesn't have to be this sort of separate entity, like, oh, I, you know, that's for students who study fully online. No, digital technology can integrate into your face-to-face -face traditional classrooms as well. And so I think this is a great way to expose you to some of the offerings, some of the structure, uh, some of the capabilities that we have at AU with digital technologies and kind of opening that up uh, here in face-to-face -face classrooms, hybrid classrooms, not just online classrooms, right? And then fundamentally, and I, I saw this so much with the example that we had with uh, the students who connected from uh, Chile and our students here at AU with the Heritage Spanish program, that there was some real deep connections, some affinity, some, so, you know, real conversations are had. And you, you want to kind of have that in your classroom, right? This sort of serendipitous uh, conversation that you, they'll learn something, but it's not something that's pre-planned on what they're learning, right? And so there's definitely room for those deeper connections that, by the way, could inspire students to rethink where they want to study abroad. Because I know AU does such a good job, such a high percentage of students, of our student body studies abroad, this could be an inspiration for them to maybe rethink that location, maybe maybe move away from some of the traditional spots and be like, you know what, I made such deep friendships, connections in, in this particular location, let's say Chile, I definitely want to start thinking about traveling over there and getting to know that culture. So just definitely a lot of opportunities for, for deeper connections. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the components. There's, there's different uh, structures that you need to put in place that are really important for COIL, and we want to highlight those. So it is two instructors, right? I want to highlight that. This is why it can work. It sort of works around uh, higher education bureaucracy in the sense that the faculty member of the institution abroad grades their students, and you grade your students, right? There's just a moment of some collaboration that happens throughout the semester, but the grading stays separate. So it's still two courses, two universities, but the coordinated syllabi is where we've seen that there's definitely some negotiation, mostly with timeline, because as you can imagine, international institutions aren't on our scene schedule. So their semester might start a little bit, bit different than our semester. And so there will be some negotiation of, you know, when exactly would be the right time to start COIL. I've noticed that it tends to start sometimes in the in between semester for us, uh, whereas the international partner, it tends to be towards the beginning. And so that's just something to, to recognize that there will be some coordination. I think that's what takes the most time, at least with the conversations between the two faculty members is what sort of weeks do they wanna have that collaboration to take place? Uh, lectures may be shared, they may not be. Right, we've seen examples of courses that are 100% asynchronous as far as the collaboration. Uh, students just communicate through WhatsApp, through various tools to sort of come together and, and collaborate on a, a subject. I don't think that brings some of the richness of the connections that could happen if you do it. So that's not best practice, but it does happen, right? It, it might make sense for your course to keep it that way. And again, the period of collaboration is can be as you know as small as five weeks where you know you have an icebreaker week one and then the students work together for four weeks in the semester or it could run the entire semester. We have not supported a course that has run the entire semester. We're actually doing it right now uh, for um, uh, a course in SIS. It, that takes a lot of coordination. That takes a lot of um, sort of understanding to try to, so like the class is running at eight o'clock in the morning to fit the time in Pakistan. So like, you know, you don't have to make that sort of negotiation. Uh, it could be on the smaller side, five weeks, right? And then ultimately that deliverable is just a shared project or discussion. We've seen video promotions like a, like ads be made for, for one course with the Heritage Spanish students. Uh, we've seen some documentaries. Videos, I think, are just such a great aspect uh, as far as a deliverable because they can be shared and it's sort of this piece that they can co-create together. So those are some of the examples we have right now 
of some of the deliverables. They've been mostly video focused, but of course there's a lot of coordination and, and conversations that happen in the lead up of that final product. Um, I wanted to uh, quickly note that uh, we'll share the slides um, at the end of the session and in a follow-up email after. So in mm. case you all want to hold on to uh, this information. Um, and uh, if I could, uh, do you want to do this one, Luis, or do you want me to do it? Or what do you think? Um, yeah, I can I can keep doing it. I can, I'll, I'll, I'll go a little bit here, Shed. That's okay. Um, so there's a little bit of the timeline, right, of what is expected. And it's really important when you do a collaborative online international learning that whether it's five weeks, or 14 weeks, you want to make sure you set some time aside to do some team building, right? And what we just did at the beginning of this presentation is a great modeling of what you should do on those first initial uh, sort of meetings or sessions which is icebreakers, right? We're not saying you should do some high ropes courses together or anything, or like a virtual breakout or a virtual, um, what is it? The, uh, the, the breakout rooms, the, the room where you have to like have the clues to try to get out. Um, escape anyway, room. I, escape, room. escape room. Thank you, Shed. Uh, we did that for one team meeting during the pandemic. It was kind of fun, but it kind of like too much. But You don't have to do something like that it can just be something that spurs conversation, right? Just like the gesture uh, activity that we did here at the beginning. But you wanna make sure to alloc allocate some time for some, some of that initial team building, uh, breaking the ice, right? And then you wanna be able to have that, those discussions that lead up to the project. You wanna make sure you have ample enough time allocated for students to connect with one another to prepare for that project. Right, getting to know one each, other, getting to know one another a little bit more. Uh, there's some guiding uh, activities you could presently uh, potentially present within this phase, where you're you're asking them to do some low stakes activities, whether it's scavenger hunt or something like that, just so that they can continue to to sort of be in dialogue. There's also a great opportunity to really reinforce what technologies are you using. Is it going to be Zoom exclusively? Is it going to be WhatsApp? Is it going to be Flipgrid? You know, there's a lot of free tools. And we we help a lot with that, uh, with that aspect on the technology piece, right? Making sure that you know what the options are and helping you set that up so prior to the semester so that it's good to go. And then ultimately, it's the, the project phase, right? That's the buildup is when they're actually then creating that deliverable. That's the collaboration piece, right? That's, that's where they're really getting uh, a taste of, being a part of an international team, right? And getting to have some of those conversations and negotiations. And I understand teamwork's not always ideal, but there's always so much lessons to be learned in teamwork as well. Uh, some, some language dynamics, we haven't, uh, fortunately it hasn't been too uh, much uh, with that, with the difference in language. I think there's a lot of great tools. I know they're not perfect, but uh, Google Translate and things of that nature that can really help sort of fill the gap uh, with students. Uh, but fortunately, all the international partners that up to this point have been able to speak somewhat English. So it's been uh, pretty clear on that end, right, of communication. And then finally, you want to have the students present their work, right? W what they've done, uh, share it out with the, with the group and really celebrate each other for that accomplishment. And that really kind of concludes the COIL sort of uh, timeline, right? It, ultimately, we have a student evaluation that we send out afterwards and, and of course with any participating faculty we do share that with you if there's anything you want to add as well to that survey but it's mostly just making sure that you know that they have a good experience that they gain any sort of intercultural competence questions like that but that's kind of the final piece um this is just another illustration of a what a co coil course timeline could look like. So I think that matches up pretty well with the one that you were sharing, Luis, um, going from an initial survey and then some sort of welcome meeting um, and uh, an icebreaker. And then a good chunk of that is collaborative activities where the different groups, the different classes engage with one another, work on whatever project they're pursuing, whether it's big or small. And then towards the end, of course, start shifting to reflection and final 
thoughts. So this is just another model of what it can look like. The, this one is a, a six week engagement, but it's really, as Louise mentioned, up to you and what you want to accomplish with your partner instructor in their class. Um, so I can talk here about the scaffolding of COIL activities and just simply how they build on one another um, as, again, sort of repeating what Luis had already said, but moving from the icebreaker and starting to build uh, connections and becoming familiar with whatever technology your class is using to communicate with one another, one or multiple platforms and then moving into learning together. So that discussion portion that Louise was talking about, that could be synchronous or asynchronous. They could be viewing the same um, materials and both commenting on it. Um, and then there's producing a shared project or outcome. So um, whatever the students are doing together, um, their sort of common goal that they're working on. And then at the end, a reflection or debriefing uh, sort of segment where each side can debrief separately or together, probably both would be positive um, to get sort of in insight from your students, yourself, and then from both classes together. So we have a bunch of examples of COIL courses here. I'm very excited um, that we uh, we have some AU ones. So I'm actually going to skip over. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, examples in this PowerPoint. I want to go straight to um, the one that uh, we did last semester. Um, and I will also, after that, I will show you the Padlet one that is really interesting. Um, but here is a course that was, well, this was actually, I feel like I should let Louise and Nick talk more about this because you had more experience with it. But um, yeah, our, one of our first COIL courses. That's right. And we actually got this connection because I think a big question is like, oh, well, you know, if I'm a faculty member, uh, how do I connect with then an inter international partner? And so we were lucky enough to connect with this partner in Venezuela through a COIL Design Institute that we participated in with other universities. And it so happens, I'll let Nick talk about the specific, specifics, but I do want to highlight that Jose Luis is actually an AU alumni. And so there's this crazy piece and connection of, of the influence that our institution has across the world. Uh, and he's a documentarian, he's a faculty member there in Venezuela. Uh, you know, of course he had the chance to, to stay in the US, but he wanted to support, you know, what's happening at home in Venezuela, which of course, uh, you know, I'm sure many of you are, are well aware of. So it was just, a, it was very, like, just a, like a real, uh, inspiring moment to just see the the influence that our institution can have on the global scale. And Jose Luis is a testament to that. But, uh, but I just wanted to share that. Nick, if you want to talk a little bit about the specific project. Absolutely. Yeah. So as you all can read on the slide, students in the United States here at AU gathered some stories via interviews with migrants from Venezuela. Uh, and then they took that and uh, pass those recorded interviews over to uh, Professor Jose Luis Jimenez, uh, documentary film students who are all the while putting together uh, a documentary so that uh, in the future, the documentary film may be shared with more organizations in the DC area to have future students sort of have a foot in the door and uh, to expand this project. Um, but since, uh, so many, I think, are curious about the early stages of COIL. I just wanted to share a little bit about the negotiations that happened at the beginning between uh, our two faculty members here. Really great conversations about their research interests. What did they hope to uh, get out of this as well, um, it, according to their course learning objectives that we met several times beforehand to uh, decide upon the uh, starting date, the sort of pieces of reading, the content that students should read about before they engage in their COIL, and then um, to kind of set into motion the, the overall theme of the COIL was going to be, we want to discuss uh, migrants and uh, human rights. So that's uh, 
at the start, kind of with the conversations that you would have with somebody that you're interested in coiling with. So I just wanted to alight on that quickly here. And then the, the where aspect, meeting synchronously via Zoom was what we set up. But then from that point forward, students created their asynchronous meetings with one another. So um, yeah, just a little bit about the project and the negotiations um, that started it. This is a full timeline of developing that course. Um, so we can give you all a second to, to read it over and then we can um, talk about that timeline. Um, Nick, do you mind sharing a little bit more about this process? Yeah, de definitely. And um, so a lot of the key points here uh, are definitely things that you can elongate, give students more time to complete or shrink. Uh, and it was, again, based upon those negotiations between Professor Kishel and Professor Jimenez and how that fit best into their each uh, unique course calendars, for example, uh, Universidad Católica Andres Bello goes into January terms and start and their terms start later than ours. So this passing off of the project from one team to another made sense for this coil. And um, because even though Venezuela has not uh, got a huge time difference between the United States, uh, we still acknowledge that students have a lot going on. So that is another reason why uh, asynchronous uh, timing could actually help the students uh, put their projects together and um, sort of alleviate a lot of synchronous time. Though the group icebreaker over Zoom, I would say it was definitely my like uh, number one experience with helping with this coil. It was great to see students uh, share their stories uh, in the icebreaker that we did was, um, find something in the room that you're in that says something about your life. And uh, it's like a show and tell, show us this, this object and uh, describe its meaning for you. And um, that was just really great to see the students' creativity and get to learn about them. And thank you for that, Nick. And um, I love hearing about how like excited and engaged the students were to do this work. And um, to your point, this is one very specific project um, that they did, but for your course, if you pursue coiling your course, it could look totally different. It really depends on what you want to accomplish um, with your peers. So not to put you on the spot, Nick, but that is Nick. <laughs> um, but is, this is from the uh, first Zoom meeting, uh, right, Nick? That's right. Yeah, it's a, it's a screenshot taken. Um... And just love seeing the smiling faces. And uh, you'll notice in the top left corner, all of Professor Kishel's students were in one room. So uh, whereas other students had, you know, gone in their individual bedrooms, found an object, uh, the students at AU just found objects on the, in their backpacks or on their person to uh, say something about themselves. So just a little bit extra there about the icebreaker. Um, and so that's the great thing about collaboration. It involves like thinking on one's feet and that we had a language difference in this meeting and there was translation going on. So a lot of definite lifelong skills that students take away, even just from this beginning icebreaker meeting, which is really cool. And then just a couple artifacts from uh, that uh, project. So the project plan on the left, and then if this is correct, uh, my Spanish is not so great. <laughs> if this is correct, Nick, um, this is the flyer to recruit folks for the interviews that they recorded. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Yep. Uh, students put all of this project plan together, minimal input from the faculty members, just pretty much paint within these lines, like we'll start this week and you, uh, we'll end this week. And uh, the students came up with the rest. I love that. It really shows like when we trust students, the really incredible stuff that they can make when we set them up for success, like you said, give them some guardrails um, mm -hmm. and then tell them, you know, we trust you and you're going to do a great job and they create something really amazing. 
Um, so I want to share one other example of a COIL course, actually, that was um, completely on uh, Padlet. So I'm sharing the link here in the chat. So this is not one of the AU COIL courses, but this is one that we like to share as an example of what an asynchronous um, sort of meeting space can look like. So these students, these classes um, actually communicated over Padlet. Um, using the different sort of columns and submitting different assignments and having different discussions in the columns. So it's really cool. Um, you can see, you know, it could be WhatsApp, it could be Zoom, it could be Padlet, it could be all these different modalities, whichever really work for you and the other class. So I think we get to the question here, is COIL a good fit for my course? What do you say, Luis? I think I think it is for almost every course. And I do want to give the example here because there's another course that we did in the fall, uh, which is Universidad Diego Portales, connecting with uh, our heritage Spanish students. And that one was interesting because it was similar to Nick's example, where you're taking students from one practice that have one specialty, you know, SIS, they're focused on one thing, and then you're taking film students on the other side. And so Diego Portales was marketing students, so very business orientated students uh, on, on their side. And then our side was heritage Spanish students, which are all, you know, Spanish. They, they know Spanish as a foundation, but uh, they can learn the more formalities of it. Right. It's a process of learning more of the formalities of the language. And so it's a great way to sort of uh, for them to to test out their understanding of uh, Latin American culture and what it is to be Latino, specifically what it is to be Latino in America. And so it was uh, wonderful. And I do want to give one example here um, is the icebreaker for them thinking of that it doesn't always have to involve technology here was actual postcards, mailing postcards to each other as the icebreaker talking about their cultural language. So for AU students talking about some Spanglish, some words that uh, that are interesting and unique within their vernacular, and then the Chilean students talking about uh, their vernacular, certain words, uh, Spanish words that are very unique to the Chilean culture, and talking about why uh, it's important or what it means and what it signifies. And it was it was a really great example. So I did want to share that as well. So I, I think it is, but it, it's up to you, faculty, faculty members, and 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 our, our fellow staff members who are here. Uh, is it a good fit? Do we have an activity here? I think is it, or do maybe a discussion? This so, is where we switch to yeah, to yeah. discussion. I I want to say that's a trick question. Is Coil a good fit for my course? Because it if you think it would be supportive for your students learning, then absolutely. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Hey everyone, well, uh, thank you for the uh, for the overview. This is interesting. Uh, I have a few questions before I can answer your question. Uh, so is this, is COIL basically for grads or undergrad students? Uh, second, would you help with finding a partner? Uh, and third, actually I have four questions. Uh, fourth, uh, third is, is there any funding available? And fourth, uh, you talked about the timeline in terms of like the, the students working together, but uh, what about the uh, preparation time? How long does that take before the actual course starts? Thank you. Great, great. Yeah, great questions. So the, so the, I will answer that we do help getting you international partners. So we help in that process. There's a website that we can go to to contact, but we're also working with our uh, study abroad office to connect with different folks. I know someone just said in the chat that uh, Madrid is here, uh, AU uh, Madrid Center. And so if there's collaboration within our own institution and with our own international sort of hubs, we also seek those out and those are great opportunities. Unfortunately, there's no funding at this time for this uh, for this project, it really is seen, at least now, is like it's an add-on, right? It's something that could really elevate your your students' classroom experience. Because essentially, what this is this does is kind of substitute a current assignment or big project 
that's that that your course has. So that's why we don't really, unless you really want to, we don't suggest doing it for the whole semester because it really takes a long time. And then you asked about the the time frame of the lead up. A lot of that, I must say, is dependent on the chemistry between you and the faculty member that let's say we set up with uh, with you. So if, if you uh, Kaldun want to pick a particular region that helps, like I want I want the North African region, or I want Latin America, or I want Asia. You know, picking a region will help us kind of focus in. But then we'll have to have like the sort of uh, almost a speed dating situation where you'll have to talk to the other faculty member about your interests, shared interests. Now we've been lucky; every first meeting has hit it right, so we haven't had to have like a second meeting. And then so from there, because that could take longer, right? If, if let's say we need to, if that faculty member just didn't work out, we need to go back to the drawing board. That could extend the time frame. But ideally, we would love to have six months, right? Lead up prior to the semester. So that literally the semester before is the best time to work on all the logistics, all those negotiations to the semester launch is that ideal time frame. Can it happen quicker? It can if you're willing, if you and the faculty member are willing to meet at a, on a weekly basis, right? So I think it's dependent on that cadence that you can establish and you can work on. But six months is that ideal where maybe you meet every other week, once a month, you know, like do check-ins, right? As you're moving along. So it's a little bit of a better pace. But I, I think three months is that bare minimum. Like if we have three months, that's the bare minimum on time frame. And Kaldun, I apologize. You had the first, what was your first question? I remember like I the first question. <laughs> Not you're just sitting on that shed. You're just waiting for me. It's the only one I remembered. Um, <laughs> uh, whether this is for undergraduates or graduates, I really think it's for any, mm -hmm. it, it's really up to you. Um, it's not exclusive to any level of student. I think we typically see undergraduate classes, but I don't think there's any reason that graduate cl classes can't participate. Uh, Louise, Nick, what do you think? Spot on, Chad. Spot on. Yeah, we haven't had a grad example yet, but there, there is no this like this can be just as beneficial for for grad students. I I think the only difficult thing, if I'm like uh, kind of thinking of of some of the obstacles for graduate students, is that if they're not full time graduate students, let's say like you know they're they're working, the coordination could be much more difficult. That's that's what I I, I would. Um, kind of foresee as an obstacle, but not impossible either. So, so to answer your question, if, if this suits me or not, uh, my answer is going to be maybe, uh, but I will probably uh, reach out and maybe we can talk. Thank you. Absolutely. And I will say that's the difficult thing. Like there's no set like template in the sense of like, it really is dependent on you, your course, the specifics of what you're trying to accomplish. We're really trying to accommodate that, right? Maybe there's there's something. So right now uh, I'm working with uh, a faculty member from our College of Arts and Sciences who's a music, music ethnicologist, or I believe I might be butchering that uh, pronunciation, but basically she studies music from different countries and she has a specialization in the country of Morocco. Uh, she spent many years studying there, studying the music, the culture there. And so she knew that she wanted to add into to her music ethnicology course a component like that because it speaks to her passion, right? What she's about. And so we connected with the university in Morocco and now have, are coordinating that process of, of creating a, a, that COIL project within her course with a faculty member from Morocco which just so happens, again, to be a musician, to be all the, so I will say as a suggestion, what, like to ask yourself, is COIL right for you? It's like, what's your passion when it comes to sort of international learning? And how can COIL help facilitate you bringing that into your classroom? I think that's a better question than just saying, oh, I wanna bring the world into the, it's like, what's, what are you passionate about, right? I, I've had discussions with faculty members, one's proposing a course on understanding French culture through food and wine, and just like how connected the, the food culture in France is to understanding French culture as a whole. Uh, and so finding French partners to work with her students to help understand that specifically in the hospitality field is what we're aiming at. So that's her passion and that's what we're trying to, 
to bring into the classroom. So I, I hope that helps as well frame, you know, this, this project. I would add too, the courses do not have to be from the same discipline. Um, we've seen like some really cool overlap. So, you know, if you're teaching a communications class, you, that doesn't mean that you have to uh, partner with an, a communications class. It's going back to what Louise said about whatever your passion is with international learning, whatever you and that other class room instructor have in common in terms of goals is what binds you together, not necessarily the discipline. So we've seen all kinds of really cool collaborations. And um, part of this is that, you know, we're we're here to work with you. Um, I must admit, I do the presentation side of things. Uh, Luis and Nick are the ones who are actually making it happen, but they help find a partner, put together your course with things like structuring um, and uh, participating in COIL itself. And so we're really happy to um, guide you through that process and help in any way we can. And I, I want to put a, sh a shameless plug here because, uh, Kadun, you brought up a good question, and it's it's not a conversation where it's not like we're not having about compensation, right? I so this it, typically, and we've we've seen with other universities, this is something that maybe is done with like a like a course release or something like that, at least on the prep time. Um, but we're on the infancy level of this project, right? Of really elevating this as a as a as a real consistent part of the AU student experience. But there are a lot of methods that we've been exploring. And so I'm exploring this currently with um, uh, Professor uh, Akbar Ahmed from SIS of potentially proposing for one of these Stevens Initiative grants on virtual exchanges, which again could, like if, if we're able to get things like this, then could bring the money to then um, compensate later on uh, for for something uh, for this project moving forward, but we just got to get there, right? And so that's why Nick, myself, Shed, we're willing to support you every step of the way. So I I literally participate. I know Nick, on and just about every meeting that you have. If there's something that I need to cover for uh, the technology piece, we don't want you to stress about that. You, we just bring your ideas, right? And we'll talk about the tools that could, whether they're free or we actually have them at our disposal, licensed. Uh, free to uh, or available to use, we want to be able to facilitate that, take that burden off your shoulders. What other questions? Oh, excellent. Angela, please go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'm, I'm eating, so that's why I've had my screen on oh. black the whole time. Um, Buen so provecho. I just want to be clear. So if we put this together and we work with you all, we we still get paid for teaching the course, right? I mean, are you saying that this is completely voluntary or no? I just want to be clear. Oh yeah, you, if you get paid for you get paid for the course. We don't I I we don't deal with any of those logistics okay. or like yeah, we don't interfere. That's not You definitely will get paid for teaching the course. Okay, great. I just got kind of lost with the money talk and I was like, wait a minute, is this all voluntary? So great. That's that's good to hear. And and if I'm just correct, you're saying working with you guys as soon as possible to try to put all the pieces together um, is the best way forward. Always just just so it gives a little bit more time to find that international partner. And then hopefully, you know, that's that's a, that partner. Once we set up the meeting is someone you do want to work with. So all those pieces could take time. And so the longer bandwidth we have, the, the better it is for you to find the perfect fit. Okay, that's great. I'm going to be reaching out. Thank you. Awesome. Glad to hear it, Angela. Yeah, for sure. If I can add to what you said, Luis, I think ideally we would like people to be paid for participating in COIL mm -hmm. or have some sort of funding for it on top of the compensation that they get for teaching a course as usual. But that's one of those things that we're looking towards in the future. Uh, please go ahead, Kate. Hi. Uh, so I teach primarily first year students uh, in one of the required core classes. Um, have you uh, done a, a course like this with first year students um, here or someplace else? Is that a, is that a good fit? I mean, I could I could see how it could be a great fit, but I was wondering if we had any experience with that. So right now we've we've done three courses. Um, 
I think most of them have been like junior, senior level courses. So we haven't delved into first year experience courses yet or core courses. Uh, the, the French food example is uh, a complex problem course. So it starts delving into the, the first year curriculum. Uh, so I'm excited to, to delve deep, but we have not had any experience. Are we aware of first year experience examples? Yes, I, there's a lot of those examples, whether through more experienced institutions like SUNY or FIU, uh, they have done a lot of those, you know, because it's really on the course, right? There's, if there's a global component to it, then it's, then it's a perfect way to introduce that into the, into the uh, course itself. Great, thank you. Can I ask uh, if it's okay, Kate, what, uh, what course is it? So I teach in the uh, writing program, so the either the one or the two semester sequence um, for the first year writing class, the W1. Um, but the second semester or the 101 class has um, has a have they have themes. So my theme is writing about nature and the environment, and I could see how that could really lend itself to this kind of a program, and I could kind of think my way to some projects. Um, that could be really cool. Uh, so that was kind of what I had in mind was maybe the, the second semester classes that have themes um, where we could work with somebody who's not teaching writing necessarily, but teaching like subject area connections. Oh yeah, would love that. Thank you for sharing, Kate. That sounds awesome. Let's see some folks in chats here. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Francisco. I don't know, is AU um, Madrid here? I know, I think it was Matt was sharing that there's some folks from that office. Hello, I'm, I'm Francisco Paco Gomez and the director of AU Madrid. Yeah, as Matthew mentioned it before. Very interesting, ah. thank you very much, eh? thank you. No, gracias a ti, Francisco, perfect. Un placer, un placer. <laughs> igualmente, igualmente. So, um, I just got to say this because I, I did a, a visit, you know, they say this, I don't know if they say this, Francisco, but they say it, but we, we say it here uh, of like, you know, you either like love Barcelona or you either love Madrid. It's kind of like one or the other because the cities are so different. Um, I don't know where you, I know you live in Madrid, so I don't know where you stand. So I hopefully don't offend, but I, I fell in love with Madrid. I visited both, but I just, there's something about Madrid that um, I just love. Of course, Barcelona has a coast. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. But, yeah. You are totally right. You are totally right. Madrid is, they are very different each other, yeah? but Madrid, okay, the program is in Madrid, and I think that is offering more opportunities to students, especially because the, the language track, you know, because in, in Barcelona, it's very rich because it's very, very, it's very, it's bilingual, you know, they mm -hmm. use Catalan and Spanish, but in my opinion, it's a little bit difficult sometimes for the student that they study in Barcelona, because they get a little bit confused in between Castellano, Spanish, or or Catalan. Then in in Madrid, unfortunately, we only speak Spanish. <laughs> but, this is very, but this is very convenient for the for the student that come here. Yeah. Awesome. So glad to have you here, Francisco. Thank you for making time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for this workshop. Thank you very much. So uh, we're getting to end of time. So um, we will stick around for a minute, but in the meantime, just want to share our contact info um, and please feel free. We have our own email address. Very exciting. Um, that's a newer feature. So uh, <laughs> please do get in touch with us. We'd, we'd love to work with you um, and we appreciate your time and uh, yeah, we'll hang out for any more questions you might have. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to go to Madrid. When do I get to go to Madrid? You got to book it. Or you got to get on um, Hannah's itinerary. I know. Hannah seems to go, Hannah seems to go place to place. She really just got to hit up your colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eva. Thank you.